Brave enough to test it. It's the Salvage Squad. If you're a submarine that's passed its sell-by date and you haven't been scrapped or sunk, you end up here, in Gosport, Britain's only submarine museum. But these things are meant to swim and that's why we're here. We're going to restore one of these little babies and watch it sink beneath the waves. But it's not one of ours, it's one of theirs. A secret weapon designed to sink the D-Day invasion force, no less. A one-man midget submarine called the Bieber. A far cry from the massive U-boats, over 300 of these mini assassins were launched against the Allies, but almost none survived the war. If we manage to get her to sink, then she'll be the only Second World War submarine capable of diving in the whole world. Her present birth is the Royal Navy Submarine Museum, dedicated to the memory of all submariners. But all its sub-aquatic kit is strictly for display purposes. Museum director and former sub-captain, Commander Jeff Tall, would dearly love to turn the clock back and transform the museum's decrepit Bieber into a piece of living history, a fully operational Second World War submarine. So, Commander, why would you like to see this little submarine restored? The men who drove these things were extraordinarily brave. And uh, really, I just like to lock their place in history and, and see, the, see uh, the thing back at sea. And as a submariner yourself, can you imagine what it would have been like well, to have been in one of these? I can only say that uh, they knew they were on a one-way mission and uh, their chances of survival were pretty low. So their courage um, was really quite extraordinary. Well, Commander, our plan is to take these bits away, put them back together, try it out in the water, hopefully not sink it permanently and bring it back. What do you mean, hopefully? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. In 1944, the tide of war had turned against the Germans. They knew an invasion armada was being assembled over the English Channel. The Bieber, with its twin torpedoes, was the Nazis' hastily planned last-ditch attempt to cause havoc amongst that invasion flotilla. This is a whole new ball game for Salvage Squad. Not only will we aim to do our usual immaculate restoration, but we're also going to have to risk someone's life to dive this veteran warrior beneath the waves. But our beaver is hardly in a seaworthy state. It's in bits, and they're rusty bits at that. Ooh, this looks like a lot of fun, Claire. I know, it's not very big, is it? it certainly isn't. It's time to call in the one man capable of relaunching our sub. Ian Clark won the Pilgrim's Trust Award for Conservation, the museum world's equivalent of an Oscar, for his restoration of Holland One, the Royal Navy's very first submarine. He may have done a classy job, but it's only a museum exhibit. If he fixes ours, it's going to have to dive. Never fear, though, Ian's quite capable of restoring machines that actually work. His other speciality is water mills. That is sheer poetry which Claire assures me are just as complicated as German midget submarines. Hey, what do I know? What do you reckon, Ian? <laughs> I don't know, it's crazy to me. Are you sure you got all the bits? Well, there's three of them here. <laughs> <laughs> it's incredible to think that people actually went down in these, isn't it? Even more incredible to think someone's going to have to when it's restored, Claire. No, not me. Not me. <laughs> Man's job, that. You've got to find someone to restore it first. Hey. <laughs> hey it's, got, it's, a, it's got its original ballast. Yeah, it's the wrong sort of ballast, though, isn't it? <laughs> Beachy Head, 1942. <laughs> nice. So you guys are serious about this? Come on, it's only a small submarine. How hard can it be? No, I think you're mad. We are, Ian. Let's do it. With Ian on the team, it's time to get our mini-sub on board. She's leaving her berth and off on her first voyage for over 50 years.
Good luck, Claire. I'm going to need it. See Cheers. you later. Well, with the bits of our beaver heading out across the water, I'm off to find out more about what these bizarre little mini-subs did during the war, and hopefully to find someone who's still alive who actually piloted one in combat. If R. Bieber had made this voyage in 1944, she'd have been headline news, because we're taking her right to the very heart of the British Navy, Her Majesty's Dockyard, Portsmouth, the home of the fleet. Luckily, things have changed a bit since then, and we've enlisted the Royal Navy Ship Repairers, Fleet Support Limited, to give us a hand in this massive restoration. And we couldn't do better, because FSL refit, fix and generally make shipshape Her Majesty's Navy, from her anchor chains to her aircraft carriers. But even with the best dockyard in the world on board, getting this midget gem to dive beneath the waves is going to be a tall order. She'll need her holes patched up. We're going to sink with a hole that big, that's for sure. Claire's going to get thrown in at the deep end, and we'll be launching a raiding party or two against our own side. Like a beached whale, this week's challenge, a 1944 German mini-sub, is lying safely in the workshops of shipbuilders FSL. And it looks like the whole workforce is interested in the latest job. But this one's not for the old hands. We're giving it to the cabin boys. At 17 and 18, these FSL apprentices are the same age as the young German pilots who would have sailed her during the war. Look, look, look how small it is. Can you imagine squeezing through that? <laughs> I think you just about fit in, Mark, so yeah. uh, you never know. The volunteers are narrowing for who's going into it. It might be a tight squeeze, but the Bieber functions just like its larger relatives. The first thing it has to do is to keep its crew alive underwater. The pilot sits in a steel cylinder called the pressure hull. This has to withstand water pressure of over 500 tonnes at the Bieber's maximum depth of 100 feet. This is the aft section of the hull. You can see that all the hull sections were bolted together through these holes, nuts and bolts. So that's the yep. back, middle and the front? Uh-huh. And each, between each section of hull, there was a rubber joint, which we're going to have to make new. The next major bit of kit that we have to tackle is the propulsion, which moves the sub along. The Bieber had a petrol engine which powered it on the surface, taking it from its home port to within range of its target. As it dived beneath the waves, the petrol engine was switched off and a battery-powered electric motor was switched on for the final few miles before firing its torpedoes. We want to get both systems up and running. Well, there's two ways of shifting this submarine through the water. We've got a petrol engine and we've got an electric motor here. I mean, they look pretty uh, nasty at the moment. 1940s, lots of rust. We'd love to use the original equipment to drive the submarine, so I think we're going to have to really pull all the stops out and um, try and make it work. On the surface, she had a range of 100 miles. Underwater, using her electric motor, the sub could travel a further eight. At least we've got a propeller. And then, coming further aft, we got to think about the rudder. It's, it's fantastic wooden rudder. Timber construction is beautiful, yeah. isn't it? It's more like you know, old yacht construction as opposed to a submarine. So rudder and diving plane. So that's left and right and up left and, and right, down. Up and down, yeah. The main directional controls are the rudder and the hydroplane. But to sink below the surface, the Bieber has to use its large ballast tanks fore and aft. That's front and back to you land lovers. To dive below the waves, the pilot lets water flood into the ballast tanks, the submarine becomes heavier and sinks. To surface again, the opposite effect is used. High pressure air forces water out of the tanks, the submarine becomes lighter and floats up. If we want to turn this museum piece into the only diving World War II submarine in the world, Claire Ian and the FSL boys are going to have to join that hull together and make it watertight get her petrol engine and electric motor working again, sort out its ballast and control mechanism, and finally, find someone mad enough to go down in it. But before we start building this baby up, we'd better see what she's made of. Because we haven't got any plans, we're being really careful to label everything up so we know what it is and where it came from. What's that, then? 
That's the uh, forward ballast tank strut brake. Cheers. We got it. I can't believe what a small space you're supposed to be sat in to work in this thing. I'm actually sat on top of the batteries, and with the tower on the top, it's going to be even tighter. This was not designed with the driver in mind. But my comfort is the least of our worries. At the back, our sub has developed a hole. Andy and I were just taking out the uh, stone gland and propeller shaft, and uh, this unfortunately just uh, dropped out. Um, you can see it's a bit on the thin side. What we'll do is we'll cut that right out and we'll let a new piece in. You can see it's uh, very badly corroded, just crumbling away. But when it's blasted, we'll be able to see the exact extent of the damage. I'm more worried about any holes that appear in the, in the ballast tanks up here or in the pressure hole in the middle. They're the important ones. There's only one way to find out how bad she is under the paint. Shot blast a lot off. Unfortunately, she was worse than we thought. It might be a bit bigger even once that's blasted a bit more. It's pretty bad, yeah. We're going to sink with a hole that big, that's for sure. Two days in, and Ian's already wondering if we're going to make it. It's not good news from a, from a submarine point of view, no, because that's going to leak very, very badly. Um, but it certainly wasn't the, uh, the shot blasting that's blasted through the hull. So it would have been a weak area and maybe had some scale over it, some rust over it. Right. But so uh, we're going to have to certainly cut it out and patch it because that, that hole up there is actually in the pressure hole. So, uh... While the engineering department are revealing the hidden problems of our sub, I'm trying to make some discoveries of my own. I've come to the Imperial War Museum to see if I can find out a bit more about our beaver. This is a magic place, and being a boffin, I get to go digging in their archives, and I've found some brilliant footage which might tell us a bit more about the history of these subs. The Germans had put all their efforts into producing U-boats, but in 1944, a maverick designer, Hans Bartel, came up with a revolutionary new idea, the Bieber. I've discovered that the Germans' plan was to launch hundreds of Biebers from the French beaches to get in amongst Allied invasion ships. With their twin torpedoes, they would pick off targets loaded with soldiers and supplies. Chaos, confusion and carnage would result. The plan was conceived at short notice. The Bieber went from drawing board to factory production in an incredible eight weeks. This urgency meant that the Bieber was put together from whatever materials the factory could get their hands on. It's why the Bieber ended up using a standard truck engine which ran on petrol, the Opel Blitz. Well, Matt, how's this lump of an engine doing? Yeah, it's looking all right now. It's all cleaned up, nice and painted. But is it in fairly good nick? Yeah, everything's in good nick. Um, show you the pistons. Well, this is the, uh, the rockers and the uh, camshaft and the head, so you all come up pretty nicely, all working. I've done a good job. It's looking, all looking very clean and very new and very shiny. And very workable. Is there much wear on it? Uh, no, not at all. If you ever look at the pistons, as you see, there's not much wear at all. There's no scorching. It's hardly Still done got any the rings. Miles, exactly. It? Yeah, it's probably only a couple of hours use. So could you get it running again? Mechanically, yes. Uh, yeah, everything's there. Well, that's some good news. I hope that our electric motor is in good nick as well, as we're going to need it if we're going to dive beneath the waves. Hence my trip to Waiko, who will give it a complete overhaul. Well, what do you think, there's Second World War German engine? <laughs> Certainly an old, an old beastie. I think it's older than me and Terry put together, this <laughs> It may be old, but this motor is definitely not worn out. You look at there, there's areas where it's not even run. All the evidence suggests the frame and the brushes which carry the electric current into the motor are in surprisingly good nick. However, it has been sat around gathering rust and dust for the last half century. A quick session with the sandblaster should sort that out. Well, that's all the rust and the flaky paint blasted away. 
and it allows you to concentrate and look at the details. On a good quality engine, all this sort of area here would be made out of good solid brass. It would have a chunky, reliable feel to it. And on this one, made during the wartime, it's, it's just made out of bits of pressed tin. Um, and it does the job. And I don't know whether they did that because it was cheaper, it was quicker, or they just didn't have the metal. But it's certainly not built to last. Long life. Right. Hopefully, the key component of the motor, the armature in the centre, was made of better materials. Believe it or not, we're dipping the whole thing in a vat of varnish. The idea is that it will soak in, effectively re-insulating it. I'll bring that up far enough so I can see. Oh, it's like chandelier in varnish. Yeah, lovely. Next, we've got to cook it. Steady. All right. That's it. You're not going to leave me in here, are you? No, I'm not going to leave you in there. <laughs> Slowly roasting on gas mark It gets four. very hot in here. Well, Terry. After an overnight bake, our re-insulated and rebuilt motor is back in Portsmouth. It's got the Wyco seal of approval, which means they're confident it will work. Absolutely lethal, though. Look at that. <laughs> Completely exposed if you want to put your finger in there. Well, don't do it, then. Oh, I'm not going. <laughs> That's mm. fantastic. Right, no excuses now. Got to make a swim. Yeah. <laughs> but an electric motor is no good without its batteries. This lot date from the 1940s, so who knows if we can bring them back to life. Now, in the dockyard, there's an expert for everything. It's just a matter of finding them. Non-magnetic bolt parts. I don't really know what they are, but I don't want them. I'm looking for Joe the battery man to see if the Beaver's two banks of batteries are going to be able to power our sub into action. This has to be the right place. Wow. Hello, Joe. Hi. I've been reliably informed that you're the man to see about batteries. And I know they're in a bit of a state. Well, if I can tell that, just look at them. But do you think we can get them going? We could have a go. Yeah? I think you can work a miracle on this one. Actually, there is a small reading on there. Really? 0.5... Of a volt. Of a volt. Well, that's got to be a good sign, is not it? So there must be something at the bottom. Pick one, we that's pretty spectacular. Yeah. The last time those batteries were charged, we were fighting Hitler. So perhaps we will manage to resurrect them. They're quite vulnerable. That 0.5 of a volt means there must be some 50-year-old acid sitting in the bottom of our battery. If we top this up, it might just work. Time for some protection. There's no real reason why it shouldn't work. The technology's simple, and judging by the state of the motor, they didn't do too much during the war. You've never looked lovelier. <laughs> why have we got all this stuff on? When you start pouring this back into the cells and the, the plate starts to absorb it again, mm -hmm. you get the danger of the acid starting to spit, so we need the gloves and obviously the vise if we get too close, and the apron. Is it going to burn this stuff, then? It does burn, yes. Keep away. Pouring sulfuric acid into the cells and charging them up is the only way to see if we're going to get a result. Quick zap should tell us all we need to know. Three hours later, and we're back in Joe's workshop. There's a few leaks here, Joe. To be greeted by a bad Science. smell yeah. and a steady drip. The batteries that we've filled with sulfuric acid are leaking. There are cracks in the cell walls. Cracks actually run all the way down the casing. Oh, it's not just where stuff's been dropped on the top, it's actually split all the way down. So, technically speaking, they're knackered. This isn't going anywhere, is it? No, that's it, I'm afraid. Sorry, I can't help you. I'll make a few inquiries. I can't promise anything, but not looking good at all. Without a battery, we can't run the electric motor to dive underwater. That leaves us the petrol engine, which can only be used on the surface. So, things aren't looking too good.
The Bieber may have been a hasty design, but the Allies took the threat very seriously and were anxious to find out everything they could about them. Deep in the archives of the Imperial War Museum, I'm reading about subs like ours, which were captured by the Royal Navy. I don't like the sound of this. In 1944, the British captured a Bieber that was floating helplessly in the sea. The pilot was dead because exhaust fumes had leaked into his cabin. The Navy towed the Bieber back into Portsmouth to investigate it. They found that the pilot had died of carbon monoxide poisoning caused by the petrol engine. And it gets worse. A Commander Halliday took the same Bieber out and got badly burnt by a leaking fuel pipe. I think I've got a ring, Claire. This petrol engine sounds like a killer. Hello? Hello, Claire. Yeah, listen, I've just come out of the Imperial War Museum, and that Bieber is a really dangerous thing. Yeah, one of the German pilots was found asphyxiated from exhaust fumes, and then an English officer who took it out for a test trial was really severely burnt by petrol leaking out of one of the fuel pipes. So I'm really starting to think that petrol engine's out of the question. I mean, I know it was designed in a rush, but we have to do something. No, I really do think the petrol engine's just too dangerous. All right, bye. I'm really annoyed. There are some Suggs phoning to say uh, the, um, the petrol engine, we just can't use it. You know, I mean, I know these things were designed in a rush, and there must be a way to get around it, but the petrol engine leaks too many fumes through to the pilot, which also means that our battery situation is not looking good, so we can't use the electrical motor, so all of a sudden the whole project's looking a bit... Mm. And the point was to make it work, not to make it a static museum thing. As the conning tower of our Bieber is dipped in paint stripper, I can't help thinking that the whole project is sinking. It seems the petrol engine is going to gas anyone foolish enough to use it, and without batteries, we'll never find out if our electric motor works, let alone dive her on it. At the moment, the best we can promise the submarine museum is a shiny but static exhibit. When we began the restoration of this Second World War German mini-sub, we wanted to say we'd restored the only fully working World War II sub in the world. Set yourself a goal like that, and you know it won't be easy. And it ain't. It's unfortunately, just... Uh... Uh, dropped out. The hull is like a sieve, the petrol engine kills people, and our electric motor has no battery. This isn't going anywhere, is it? No, that's it, I'm afraid. At the moment, we'll be lucky to even get her floating in the water. But just like the cavalry in some western, half the fleet have arrived. It's refit time. They can fix anything here, even the Ark Royal. She's the Navy's biggest ship, 20,000 tonnes of kit. With all this activity, it means Battery Man Joe has shelves full of the Navy's finest triple A's, and he reckons one set might just power our sub. Hello, Joe, how you going, mate? Bad. Got some news for us? I have got some news. I've had a look at my batteries that I've got here, and I've got one that, that might be I right up your street. Is it a similar size, I mean, like, capacity-wise? Capacity-wise, it's the original. the originals, yes. But what about physical size? That's the next thing. Our submarine's a bit, a bit on the small side. Oh, it's only about the right size. Looking very good. That's it, we're having it. <laughs> we may have a project after all. All right. Do you want it back? I do need it back, yes. <laughs> How long have we got? About a month. That should be all right. That should be all right for you, about a month. Promise we'll bring it back. We should better get to France and back in that time. <laughs> <laughs> You're a star. Cheers. Cheers, Thanks, Joe. Joe. See Catch you later. later. Don't forget to bring the battery back. <laughs> I tell you what, that is really good news. Well, I'm glad it's made you smile. Now we've got some juice, we might actually get that boat underwater and drive oh, it along. To France and back. Come on, let's go with it. That battery's got enough power to shift our sub on the surface and underwater. We're back to action stations. I was afraid our submarine was beginning to become just another dry, dusty museum exhibit. But these batteries means we can turn it back into a living machine and, importantly, really start to feel what it was like for those young submariners disappearing beneath the waves. The Beaver was designed with one main mission in mind, attacking any Allied invasion force trying to land on the beaches of France. 
But on D-Day, the 6th of June 1944, when 7,000 ships and 127,000 men stormed across the channel, only three Bieber were ready. The Allied advance was so quick that soon the Bieber fleet had to retreat to Rotterdam. Instead of a short run to a rich target, they now had to travel over 50 miles in order to harass Allied shipping entering the busy port of Antwerp. Well, I found a record of Bieber actions, and it really is incredible. On the 23rd of December 1944, 11 Biebers sailed, none came back. Then on the 6th of March, again 11 sailed, and again, none returned. Look here, though. On the 12th of March, 15 went out, and two did return. They really were the lucky ones. These were suicide missions. These guys must have known they were just not coming back. No wonder I'm having trouble tracking down any Bieber pilots from the Second World War. So few survived. But after weeks of trying, I've just got lucky and received an email from this man, Heinz Hubler, who dived in Biebers during the war. So I'm going to see if I can get in touch with him. Back at the dockyard, things are starting to go well. Not only do we have the batteries we need, but our hull has been patched and made watertight. But the thing that is really going to keep the water out is this sealing strip, which I'm responsible for. We don't actually know what sealed the two sections of hull together, and we're using neoprene seal. But it could have been like an asbestos joint and red lead, or it could have been natural rubber, or it could, because it was towards the end of the war, been an, an artificial rubber that they started to make. Whatever, as long as it does the job, fine. After a few phone calls, I've managed to hook up with 80-year-old Heinz Hubler and his son Gerhard. Heinz is one of the last people alive who actually dived in a Bieber. He enlisted in the German Navy in 1940 and volunteered to pilot Biebers in combat in 1944. He remembers his first week's training as an exciting time for a 20-year-old. And what was it like to get into a Bieber for the first time? It was very easy to drive and very interesting diving because the sea was very clear and I could see all the fish swimming round. I was young and never thought about the danger. It was a bit like getting the keys to a new sports car. You want to get in and drive it to its limits. The mini-sub was only designed for short attacking trips, but from its new base in the Netherlands, the pilots faced lengthy sea journeys to reach enemy ships. The Bieber was operating at the edge of its capabilities. Heinz will never forget seeing 18 Bieber sailing out on Christmas Eve 1944. Only one of those men returned. He was decorated with a Knight's Cross and, and given three weeks' leave. Spotted by British motor torpedo boats, four were sunk on the spot. One hit a mine, and the remaining 12 scattered and were never seen again. Most of them throws to death because there was no heating on the boat. Or... They suffocated. These were mostly raw recruits with only six weeks' training. Their youthful enthusiasm was no match for their lack of seafaring experience. Swept by currents into open seas, they quickly got lost and faced near certain death, either from Allied aircraft, suffocating, or freezing in icy water. Well, it does make me a little sad, because I think of my colleagues and comrades who didn't come back. Those are memories that are reawakened, and they're not good ones. It's good to talk about the Bieber again, but my pleasure is, is mixed with sadness. Things that you've survived always stick with you. For all his horrific memories, Heinz was adamant that the Bieber was a seaworthy vessel if used by trained operators. But in fact, the craft themselves were very good and would have been much more effective. Yeah, it was, it was nice to ride and easy to handle. After the war, I thought that it would be a, a nice craft just to have fun, to, to dive underwater. So even now, Heinz still believes the Bieber could have been a devastatingly effective weapon if it hadn't had to sail so far to its targets. Our restoration will give us a chance to prove whether Heinz is right or wrong. 
And back at the dockyard, things are progressing at last. With our borrowed battery firmly in place, Ian and the FSL boys are putting the Bieber's motor, engine and system controls into position. I'm leaving them to it because I need to find out whether I've got the right stuff to take our Bieber below the waves. I realise exactly how dangerous our Bieber can be, but I still want to pilot it if I can. And that's why I've come to Scotland to talk to someone who knows all about underwater vehicles. Hello. Hi Is there. Tom Heron around? Yeah, just here. Tom? Yep. Ah, clear. Hi. Come on over. Oh, cheers. Oh, Tom. It's a bit cramped, <laughs> to say the least. Yeah. Should we get rid of the... Yeah, we'll get rid of the seat <laughs> then, and then we'll be underway. When a Royal Navy submarine gets into trouble, they call out the unique L5 submersible rescue vehicle. It's a craft capable of being launched anywhere in the world and can dive to depths of over a thousand feet to rescue the crew. This is brilliant. I can't believe I'm sat in a submarine. Its pilot is Tom Heron. With 27 years of diving experience, I'm getting advice from the expert's expert. Tom's giving me a fantastic tour of the lock. I love it down here, and I'm more determined than ever to pilot our Bieber. Tom, this is just unbelievable down here. There are so many dials and switches. And yeah. Have you heard what we're doing down in Portsmouth? I've, I've heard You've heard rumors, the rumours? Yes, rumours that there's uh, we've got ourselves, something being resurrected. Yeah, yeah. we've got ourselves a, a Second World War submarine. Mm. One man. Yeah. What I really want to do is pilot it myself. How long is it going to take, realistically, to train? I would think... I, uh, I'm a quick a learner. Crash, a crash course of anything from six months to a year. <laughs> six months? Our borrowed batteries have to go back in six days. So it looks like this is as far as I go as a submariner. But Tom seems like a nice chap, so I pop the question. Um, how would you feel about going down uh, in a 60-year-old submarine? Uh, whoa, uh, Come on, when are you yeah. ever going to get the chance, Tom? You're right, you're absolutely right, and, uh, and uh, for history, uh, just to feel what these guys felt like, you know, when maybe 19 years old, being put out into the middle of, uh, of, of the sea, going hunting for, uh, you know, uh, a ship. I can't miss it. Yes, we'll go and do it. OK, I'm not going to promise anything, but it's such a good project, you're going to love it. You're I can't wait. Absolutely love I can't it. wait. It's great Tom's on board, but now we need a working submarine. Claire's back to bolt our three sections together. It's all hands on deck, and this is where my expertise comes in. It's just about as awkward as you could possibly design something. Good, is it? <laughs> this is where the real crucial stuff's going on. This ain't straight, that ain't fixing together no way. No amount of pipes and rubber seals matter if this ain't... Yeah. <laughs> I'm starting to feel like an Australian wicketkeeper down here. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was pretty good, I think. I'm not convinced by this rubber seal thing, though. Uh, so, Ian, are you telling me, with all these bolts and rivets, that that is actually what is going to be between a man drowning or living? That's <laughs> that the flimsy one. bit of rubber? That's it, yeah. And who made this? <laughs> Claire. <laughs> Claire? <laughs> Out What's your, your problem, eh? Having mum's old wetsuit and a, one of those hole punches you get on an office desks. <laughs> I can't believe it. We've got this far, and that's what we're hoping will seal this thing. Well, good luck. That's all I can say. No worries, mate. That's it. Claire. I really don't fancy this. Go on. Get in there. You've got to go in it. You've got to get in it. Well, if it means I don't have to go when it when it's in the water, I'll give it a go. I don't think there's any graceful way to get in. No. An arabesque and a cartwheel, maybe. No, oh, that wasn't much of a struggle. I'm not in yet. Can you get your shoulders in? 
What's no. Have you got your arm stuck? Are they midgets that drove this? No. German midgets. <laughs> right. Happy? That's extremely unpleasant. It's like being locked in an out outside lavatory with a load of knobs and buttons in it. How did you get out, by the way? Where's the ejector button? <laughs> it's finished, but somehow I think it's lacking a little bite. <laughs> It's the day before our submarine is due to dive, and number eight dock is being made ready with two and a half million gallons of water. Suggs. That's what it needed, isn't it? You've been putting in some overtime, haven't you? I think she looks magnificent. I wonder if Tom will agree. He's come down to have his first look around. Oh. Hello, Matt. How are you? Are you He's going to take my place yeah. and uh, pilot the sudden ring. Well done, Tom. You're a yes. braver man than I. I'm afraid I'm not up to it, so... What do you well, think? I, I can't wait. It's absolutely wonderful. It's phenomenal, isn't it? What a thing. Can, it's, uh, can I touch it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely fantastic. So you're all ready to go, then, Tom? Yes, absolutely. Um, we need to do some initial testing, obviously, uh, just to see that she's pressure tight inside to a, a wee squeeze no, test on her. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure she and, is. I'm sure she is. And waterproof. And waterproof, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm up for it. Let's get it in the water. Okay, Great. let's go for it. We're going to start by doing the very simplest test, dunking her in the water to see if she leaks. All our hard work is under the spotlight now, and Ian's reputation's on the line. Slightly nervous. But it's Tom who's risking his life. It's his decision whether he goes ahead tomorrow or not. Failure today could mean the end of the project. Will it sink or will it swim? Tom's backup crew are on the dockside and in constant communication. Yeah, I'm just looking here. I've got a bit of water here. Uh-oh. There's a problem. Yeah, it seems to be coming from up for it. Yeah, Roger. Uh, any concerns at all, obviously, we'll bring you out the water. So uh, it's your call. Keep your eye on it. And when you're not happy, we'll lift you back out to them. Sure, it? it looks like a steady flow coming from somewhere. Yeah, Roger that. Our worst fears are realised. There's a leak, and it's a bad one. Yeah, I've got my After only five minutes, Tom calls off the test. And I switched off all my life support to listen. And all of a sudden, they had running water, of course, which is a matter I doesn't want to hear. <laughs> and, uh, and there it was, it was coming into my feet. The leak is bad. Even in this short time, the floor is covered, and we'd have been swamped if we'd left it any longer. You yeah. think this is how the Germans did it? <laughs> I think not. But even though we know it's leaking, and leaking badly, no one is sure where the water is coming from. So it's back to the workshop for some hard talking. Everyone has an opinion on how to find the leak, but the simplest solution is a bit like how you'd find a puncture in a bicycle tire. Air is pumped inside the submarine at pressure. It's then a case of listening to find the hissing air. But although we can hear it clearly, we just can't pinpoint exactly where it's coming from. It's cutting through somewhere, yeah. yeah. Fortunately, Tom's brought with him a secret weapon, a special fluid like posh washing up liquid. Simple and effective. It shows a massive leak around the front joint, and it's one of my rubber seals that's playing up. There's only one solution, and there's no avoiding it. We're going to have to pull the front end apart, which means undoing 50 bolts, resealing the joint, then putting it all back together again, hoping for the best. It's going to be a late night, and there'll be no time to check this seal again before tomorrow. Our Bieber submarine has sprung a leak, and we've been making running repairs overnight. But it's now or never. Today is the day we find out if our project will sink or swim. And the Royal Navy Submarine Museum's director, Commander Jeff Tall, has come to see what we've done with his prized exhibit. Ta-da! Oh, fantastic. 
Oh, wow. Can we have a closer look? A bit different. She's beautiful. You wait till you see the inside. Hello, Gosh, I really didn't think you'd pull this off. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> it's just fantastic. Well, she's a different animal. Yeah. And fully, and fully operational. God. <laughs> I mean, what you've done here has brought history back to life. Four months ago, this beaver was a washed-up warship. It was just a collection of rusty sections and broken dials. Now, incredibly, we've made it seaworthy, ready to dive for the first time in 60 years. It's a massive achievement, but it won't mean a thing if she's not watertight and sinks for real. Have our overnight repairs worked? I'm really looking forward to this. And so, by the looks of things, it's everybody else. Almost the entire dockyard has turned out to see this thing go in the water. Wonderful. There are some of the finest shipwrights in the world gathered around the dock, but there's only one man who really knows if we've done our job properly. The only person here who's actually seen one of these weapons in action. Our veteran Bieber operator, Heinz Hubler, who's flown over from Frankfurt with his son Gerhard. I'm Bieber. We are in Erinnerung have. We will junge Leute enttäuscht wurden and nach ihr Leben lassen musste. He's happy to see the Bieber after so many years, but he still remembers that many of the young people died because of Bieber and died in combat. Of course, of course. Come and have a closer look, Heinz, yes. Yes, of course. It's the first time he or anyone else has seen an operational Bieber since the end of the war. Heinz is one of the few men who piloted these craft and survived. This is it's very comfortable. Yeah, yeah comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's okay, yeah? Yeah. It's a good yeah? She's good? Yeah. She's an old beauty. She's an old beauty, absolutely. Yeah. I can't wait to get in there uh -huh. and dive her and see what she does. Everyone on the dockside wants to see this Bieber running underwater, but this is a 60-year-old, untested machine. So to start with, Tom will take her down while still attached to the crane. Have our repairs sealed the leaks? The control, this is B105, hatch one is shut. I think it's about to disappear yeah. into yeah, the yeah, dock, yeah. isn't it, now? Will we ever see it again? This is a far cry from L5, Tom's multi-million pound state-of-the-art submersible. Without modern gauges or alarms, he will have to rely on his experience and instincts and be ready to react to any leak or failure. I don't really need to ask you, Ian, but how are you feeling? Extremely nervous. It shows on your face. Does it really? <laughs> looking that grey, am I? You're looking very, very pale. I just, I can't, I can't hear what Tom's saying. I don't know what's happening. I mean, presumably there's no, there's no leaks and everything's working OK. It seems to be all right. I just don't know. But I'm certainly very nervous. I mean, somebody's actually inside that submarine. For the first time in over half a century, a manned Bieber sinks beneath the waves. She sinks all right, but when Tom blows her tanks, will she resurface or just sit on the bottom of the dock? We can only wait and hope her systems work. Absolutely brilliant. The great news is our repairs are holding. The Bieber is watertight. Fantastic that was, wasn't it? <laughs> Next, Tom needs to test the motor before he can attempt an underwater dive. She looks brilliant. Marvelous. Fantastic. Her motor works like a dream. I suppose for a submariner, it's a once in a lifetime experience, isn't it? I mean, you're not going to get many of those, are you? It's the only working Bieber in the world. Yeah. And to experience the submarine technology from the 1940s is quite very, something. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Hello. Hello. <laughs> that looked absolutely fantastic. It Tom. was fantastic. I, I, it felt great. Charging just, up and down the dock. Oh, wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. I, if only that dock gate wasn't there, I'd be off. But what's uh, it like being cooped up in such a small space? Well, I don't feel cooped up, you see. 
because I do this all the time. But uh, do you feel I suppose, at home down there? Absolutely then? wonderful. <laughs> It's a fantastic result so far. Tom is confident enough to put the Bieber to the ultimate test. Will she dive? <laughs>